Shall we rise up as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We bless your name because you always gather us together so that you can reveal your mind to us. We're asking, Lord, that tonight your word will be plain to everyone in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that our ignorance of your nature, of your power, of your plan, of the fulfillment of your prophecies, our ignorance concerning your timetable, you take the ignorance away tonight in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that you keep us awake at alert so that we'll not sleep as your word is coming forth in Jesus' name. We pray that every word, every sentence, every judge, every teacher, everything you have for us in your word, you will implant within our hearts in Jesus' name. That your spirit will breathe upon the word and will take this word, make it alive in every heart and every life in Jesus' name. We pray that our coming here, listening and learning will not be in vain. But that Lord, you will help us to retain your word to profit by your word, and to prepare ourselves for the coming of the Lord, so that that day will not come upon us unprepared. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. You can be seated. Thank you. We're still in the study of Second Peter. In this second epistle of Peter to the believers, it's been talking about the coming of the Lord. And the coming of the Lord had been doubted by unbelievers, by backsliders, and by scoffers. In fact, they had started asking a question. And it was because of this question that Peter the Apostle, inspired by the Spirit of God, wanted to clear it up to the believers so that the believers will understand that God is still in the process of fulfilling his word. Look at the question they were asking in Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 4. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? Where is the promise of his coming? These people, the scoffers, as they are named in verse 3, they had started not only doubting privately the coming of the Lord, but publicly. They were already projecting their doubts, instilling their doubts, injecting their doubts in their minds and the hearts of other people. And they were saying, after all, since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. It was because of this doubting, this unbelief, and this calling of the word of God. Not only doubting privately, but wanting other people to doubt the coming of the Lord. That the Spirit of God inspired the apostle. So that the apostle will be able to emphasize to other people that Christ is still coming again. If you look at it from verse 3, it says, Knowing this, first, that there shall be in the last days coffers walking after their own laws. And this is what they'll be saying. Where is the promise of his coming? And the argument they have is that everything has continued as it had been before. If you were in our previous studies, I reminded you that these people were willingly ignorant. They were willingly ignorant that the power of God is able to suspend the course of nature and the laws of nature. And that the Lord had done it a number of times. He divided the Red Sea. He made the sun and the moon to stand still. He gave manna from heaven. He brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly people. He made Peter to walk on water. That the laws of gravity, the laws of nature, had been suspended a lot of times. And so for these people to say that everything had continued the way it was from the beginning, and that the laws of nature can never be suspended, they were obviously ignorant of the scriptures, ignorant of the power of God. But then Peter tells us in verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that these doubters and these unbelievers and these coffers and these backsliders, in their argument, actually they were willingly ignorant. The scriptures were there. They could check up. They were so lazy they couldn't check up in the word of God. They were intelligent enough to have read, to have understood that things had not been as they were saying. 
but they deliberately close their eyes and close their minds and close their hearts to the word of God. They were willingly ignorant, but that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the world and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And then they were ignorant of the fact that the heavens that now are and the earth that we now have will be destroyed by fire because it's kept in storm. Now you see the word ignorant in verse 5. They willingly are ignorant. And then in verse 8 it says, but beloved be not ignorant. He wants us to make a distinction. And to make a difference between the beloved, between the believers and the unbelievers. Between the people that are expecting the coming of the Lord and the people that have coffers and doubters. And they are no more expecting the coming of the Lord. They are ignorant, they are willingly ignorant. But you children of God, people of God, it says be not ignorant. What's he saying? Look at it in that verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is of the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. This is what these people were saying. It's like God has forgotten. It's like God is abandoning his project. It's like God is no more a uh, wanting Christ to come again. It's like God because he has delayed. Delay means denial. It means abandoning of his program and prophecy and promise and project that it will not come again. But then he said, you must remember this, that one day with the Lord is like a thousand years. And a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slack. It's not forgetful. Neither is he weak, it's not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards what not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Men always misinterpret God's actions because the ordinary finite mind, without the help and the illumination of the Holy Spirit, cannot understand. The finite mind of God. You think about a baby just born. Trying to understand everything that the father would have planned and thought and would have done. I will plan to do. Then you understand how the finite mind. How men and women of yesterday. How men and women of limited time. Limited intelligence. Limited understanding. How men and women cannot understand the plan. The program. The prophecies, the intentions, and the works of the almighty, infinite God. In Job, we're told about this attribute of God. In Job chapter 11, Job chapter 11, reading in verse 7, it's asking like a question, Canst thou by searching find out God? It says, as a finite-minded man. As a man with limited understanding, as a man or a woman of yesterday, can you, by searching, find out God, all the plans of God, all the promises of God, all the prophecies that God has given, everything that God intended to do, can you, just by searching, can you, just by thinking, can you, just by your little brain or little computer, can you find out everything that God intends to do? Just by searching, can thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Uh, can you say you've got it figured out, you know how it's going to happen, you know what will happen and what will not happen? And that's the terrible mistake that these scoffers made. Scoffers uh, misinterpreted God's mercy as an indication that he's not able to keep his plan of Christ coming again at the appointed time. Here Peter, inspired by the Spirit of God, is telling us God is not slack concerning his promise. He's not forgetful concerning the fulfillment of the prophecy. He's waiting so that the sinners out there, the unbelievers out there, will be able to hear the word of God and they will repent. It's because there was a repentance, the salvation of those who are still in sin today. That's the reason why he's still waiting. Let no scoffers say the love of God or the delay of judgment means the weakness of the Almighty and the tolerance or toleration of sin. God's readiness to forgive sinners is interpreted as his inability to carry out his threats of punishment. Yet God will not rush into action 
to prove anything to doubters and scoffers. You know, a human beings, the way human beings think is so funny and so pathetic. And they say, well, we're saying that Christ will not come again. We're saying that Christ is delaying too much. And if, if God wants to prove us wrong, let him rush and do something. My dear friend, you cannot rush the Almighty. He is almighty. A little ant crawling on the ground cannot rush the mighty man that is of great intelligence. In the same way as the ant is to the man, so puny man, limited man, finite man, unintelligent man, unintelligent scoffers, so that's the way they are to almighty God. And that's the reason why God did not say, because the doubters are doubting, because the scoffers are scorning. And because the unbelievers are unbelieving. And because the backsliders are saying that God will never pro uh, fulfill his promises anymore. Let me rush and do something. God has his own program. And God has his own timetable. Actually, God is loving. And God is long-suffering. And God is merciful. He does not delight in the punishment of sinners or afflicting sinners, backsliders, and scoffers. Deliberately open your Bible to Lamentation chapter 3. And you will see this attribute of God, the goodness of God that shows us how he does not afflict men willingly. Lamentation chapter 3. I'm reading to you from verse 33. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. That's the reason he's so slow. In, it appears so slow that he has not fulfilled this promise and prophecy of Christ coming again. Because he's gracious and he desires the repentance and salvation of all sinners. And it's because he has given us the free will. We have the free will to choose. He already said, I lay before you life and death, blessing and cursing. He counsels us, he commands us, he encourages us to choose life. But he's not going to force life and salvation on us. If he could overrule the free will of man, he would make all sinners repent. He will save everyone immediately. If he wanted to crush the scoffers, their will, he will convince every scoffer against his own will to believe the truth. What seems like delay is the evidence of God's patience. For the unbelievers who need to repent, to be saved, and to escape the judgment of God. And look at that passage again in Second Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But his long suffering to us, what? Not willing, not willing, not willing that any shall perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why today we have made the title of the study God's Desire for the Repentance of All Sinners. God's Desire for the Repentance of All Sinners. We divide the study into three parts. Number one, the reckoning of a day. By God. The way God reckons time. The reckoning of a day by God. Number two. Reasons for seeming delays by God. What does it seem? That sometimes it looks like it's a delay. Reasons for seeming delays by God. Number three. Repentance desired and demanded by God. Repentance. Desired and demanded by God. I come back to number one. Reckoning of a day by God. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, he was talking to believers here. He wanted now to address, hey, let's leave the scoffers alone. After all, no matter how long you preach, no matter what you say, no matter what revelation you bring to them, they don't want to know. They close their eyes to the truth. They are willingly ignorant. Now let's concentrate on the beloved believers. But beloved, be not ignorant. That is, you that love the Lord, you that are waiting for the coming of the Lord, you that have the witness of the Spirit within you, that Christ is coming again. But maybe you are being confused by what is confessed and the unbelievers are saying. Leave them alone. Leave them aside. Let's talk to you. Be not ignorant. Ignorant of what? Of this one thing. 
Man is ignorant of the mysteries of God. And without revelation, we cannot know the mysteries. Even after we are born again, you'll know that many times when Jesus Christ was talking to his own disciples, he'll say, are you yet without understanding? Because the mysteries of God are so deep and so high and so broad and so wide that finite man, even though born again, will not be able to know everything unaided, uninspired, not illuminated by the Spirit of God. That's the reason why man is ignorant. We need the hell, the illumination, the inspiration, the revelation of the Spirit of God before we will be able to know these things. Man is ignorant of the mysteries of God. Even the modern man with all his advanced knowledge of, of the material world is still ignorant of the nature of God, the thoughts of God, the plan of God. Without revelation from God, man may know what concerns the temporary passing world, but he is ignorant of God's plan. He's ignorant of the things affecting his eternal happiness and eternal destiny. But then the word of God is saying here, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord like a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The scoffers were ignorant of this, but you believers be not ignorant. You know the way they thought? They thought that God calculated time the same way that they did, that men do. Man only has a short time to live. And if he does not accomplish his purposes in a very short, a very brief period, he never will. But God is not like that. With him, he lives forever. And in the infinity of his own existence and duration, there is abundant time to accomplish all his plans. Well, the Lord, a thousand years is just like one day. What seems to be a delay then to us is not so to him. Because by the time you think of a thousand years, you already have more than ten generations of people. If they were to live a hundred years after one another, after one another, it will take a long time. And you think that is long, but to the Lord Almighty, all that is still like just one day. His plans and purposes are not abandoned just because they seem to be delayed in our own estimation. Christ is coming again, Christ will come again. As he promised, he will not fail. He is coming at God's appointed time. In the timetable of God, there is no delay. Uh, let us look at what the apostle is telling us about this coming of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. And you see in the scriptures over and over and over that even the believers are called upon not to be ignorant here it says but you brethren i would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope others which have no hope the unbelievers the doubters the backsliders the scoffers others which have no hope you distinguish yourself and be very different because you are a believer you are the beloved of the lord he's going to prepare a place for you while he's preparing a place for you, you need to be prepared for the place that he has gone to prepare for you because eyes have not seen ears have not heard neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that god has prepared for the people that fear and love him but this is a reveal unto us by the spirit of god that's why he's saying if you're a believer if you're a child of god be not ignorant and these people those who have slept and they have already died they were wondering now christ said he will come and christ has not come and these people are falling asleep when christ eventually comes what will be the lord of these other people that's why paul was writing to the believers here that you should not be ignorant of this one thing too in verse 14 for if we believe that jesus died and rose again even so them also which sleep in jesus will god bring with him for these will say unto you by the word of the lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the lord shall not prevent shall not proceed shall not hinder them which are asleep for the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of god and the dreading christ shall rise forth 
beloved brethren, all those people that died, you think they have missed something because Christ has not come yet. When Christ comes, they are the people to rise forth. And then we which are alive in verse 17 and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another. That he is those people that are sorrowful, those people that are dejected, those people that are thinking maybe he will not come again, therefore they are sorrowful. Be not ignorant and comfort one another. But well, these words is calling upon us not to be ignorant. In Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15, verse 16, Matthew 15, verse 16, and Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Disciples, I call you some of you from chapter 4. And you've been listening to me, hearing these words from heaven. And the Father knows you. And your names are written in the book of life. Obviously, you are born again. You are forgiven. And you have the hope of life eternal, of reigning with me in the kingdom of God. Are you yet without understanding? You understand then? If those disciples that were intimate with Jesus Christ and close to the Lord Jesus Christ and they were following Jesus Christ everywhere, if those disciples could still be challenged and accused of ignorance, how much more those of us that didn't see Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. But then that's the reason why the Lord is telling us, come to understand. That God does not reckon time like human beings reckon time. That God does not behave and God does not think and God does not plan and God does not rush like human beings. Are you yet without understanding? He wants us to now come to a greater understanding, to become matured in, in understanding. He doesn't want us to be thinking like baby Christians like childish Christians, like the people that do not know that God is great and God is mighty and God is infinite and you cannot measure God and God does not think like you think, like I think. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20, Brethren, be not children in understanding. When we come to spiritual matters, be not children in understanding. When we talk about spiritual gifts, be not children in understanding. When we talk, talk about the resurrection of the dead and the rapture and the coming of the Lord, be not, uh, be not uh, like children in understanding. When we talk of the timetable of God, when Christ will come and the time it has taken and it appears very long, how many years now between the time Jesus died and was buried and rose again until now, almost like 2,000 years. And if you calculate that in the time of God, it's like two days have passed already. If a thousand years is like one day, two thousand years would be like two days. It's like just, you know, the other day before yesterday. That this thing happened in the mind of God, in the calculation of God. And so that's why he's saying, come on now, and reason like God will reason, and come to the level of God, and come to the understanding of God, that God doesn't think, and God doesn't feel, and God is not saying that he has abandoned his project, or that he's not going to fulfill what he wants to fulfill. Because the thousand years, two thousand years that have passed already, they're just like two days in the sight of the almighty God. It says, brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it? In malice, be children. In malice, be children. What does that mean? I'm, I'm sure you understand. If you have those little kids and little, little children back at home, you know, they offend one another. Now, nah, I'll not play with you again. And then two, three minutes after that, they rejoin together again and they are fellowshipping and laughing and running together again. As for malice, be like children. As for grudges, be like children. As for interpersonal relationship, be like children. As for your friend, me, I will never greet you again. Be like children and just forget it after a minute or two. But in understanding, understanding the plan of God and the program of God and the prophecies of the coming of the Lord, be not children. It says, I'll be it in malice, be ye children, but in understanding, be men. That is, be like the people that understand. God doesn't think like men. His timetable is very, very different from the timetable of man. In Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 55, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. 
My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. When you plan to do something, there's a kind of timetable you follow. When Almighty God plans to do something, there's a timetable he follows. And therefore, he wants you to understand that his thoughts are different from the thoughts of finite man. And his ways are different than the ways of finite man. And when finite man thinks that the thing is too long, the thing is too delayed, maybe it will never happen again. God doesn't think like that. And how many of us, uh, after we've been born again for five years and ten years and twenty years and more than twenty years, we still think like we used to think. We measure time like we used to measure time. And if we have been praying for something and the answer has not come for two or three months, uh, we act like we used to act. Because we're not growing, we're not getting nearer and nearer and nearer unto the Lord. And yet, as we are following the Lord day by day, month after month, year after year, we should be getting nearer and nearer unto the Lord. So that the way we thought before, we don't think like that today. And the way we spoke before, we don't speak like that today. And the way we are planning things before, we don't plan like that today. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Let's then come to the understanding that Almighty God, in His infinity, infinite mind, in the way he thinks and in the way he plans. He's not reasoning like you and I are reasoning. He's not planning like you and I are planning. He's not thinking that now because it's taken about 2,000 years and Christ has not come, then these coffers are saying I'm delaying too much and so they will not accuse me of abandoning my plan and my project and the prophecy. Let me rush and do something. God is not like that. He sits on the circle of heaven. And he looks at everything. And he sees everything. And he plans according to the way, according to his own mind. And then we read in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, reading from verse 25. These coffers actually, uh, their coffin will not make God to, relieve, to release the information to them. Or to reveal uh, the thing that uh, they really do not know. Uh, the, the, the scoffing, the doubting, the unbelief will not make God to just rush and deliver it unto them. Uh, you know, we human beings, uh, the way we act, um, if uh, somebody is doubting our knowledge, is doubting our ability, and he voices it out, we want to convince that individual we're knowledgeable. Therefore, we rush to give him information. Now, you say, I don't know that thing. Let me rush and give you information so that you will know how wise I am, how intelligent I am, how well informed I am. God is not like that. If he knows that there are people who deliberately close their minds and close their hearts to the truth, if he knows there are people that deliberately scoff at the watch of the Lord, instead of rushing and saying, let me reveal it to them quickly, he even hides it away from them. In Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11 reading from verse 25, And at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. All these things that God is revealing to us as we come every Monday and as we fellowship together and as we learn the word of God together. What theologians do not know, what seminary graduates do not know, and what people that think that they devote time to the study of the Bible alone, and they study the original languages and everything, what they do not know, the Lord is revealing them to babes. You may not know the Greek or the Hebrew or the ancient languages, but because you have a tender heart, a seeking heart, a heart that wants to know the Lord and wants to know the word of God, the plan of God, the fulfillment of his prophecies, is revealing all these things unto babes. No wonder those coffers, they kept on scorning and doubting and arguing about everything, and yet God did not rush to reveal anything to them. But the simple-hearted believers who are willing to take the word of God at face value, who will accept the word of God with all readiness of mind, and then they go back to the scriptures searching to see whether those things were so. The Lord will reveal to them, but to these people that appear prudent and wise and high and intelligent and 
whatever titles they may have, God does not reveal unto them. In Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, verse 33, Romans 11, verse 33, it's still talking about the very fact that God is so great and God is so deep and uh, you cannot search out the depths and the height of his wisdom. In Romans chapter 11 verse 33, Oh, the depths of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. The depths of the riches of his wisdom and of the greatness of his knowledge. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out i come back to second peter chapter three second peter chapter three verse eight but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing that one day with the lord it says a thousand years and a thousand years as one day this coffers by the way these were people that had read the old testament and it's surprising to you how many people can read the Bible over and over and over. And the things they have read would have supplied answer to the questions they, ask, they have in their minds. But it's like when they're reading the Bible, they read the Bible. When they close the Bible and they go into thinking about other things, then they think independent of the Bible, independent of the revelation received already in the Word of God. If they read their Bibles very well and they remembered what they read, what Peter was saying here had been said in the Old Testament. Look at Psalm 90, Psalm 90 verse 4. And this shouldn't have been a problem to them at all. If they would allow the Spirit of God to recall, to remind them of what they had read, they wouldn't have had any problem about this. In Psalm 90 verse 4, Psalm 90 verse 4, For a thousand years in thy sight, uh, but as yesterday, which when it is past, and as a watch in the night, these coffers, if they had just read the Psalms all over again, and if they had prayed that God, we were ignorant, we don't know, but we want to know. We're thinking that the prophecy being fulfilled is being delayed. We're thinking that uh, the coming of the Lord, as you said, that the world will be judged. And then all the elements of the earth will vanish away, will, will melt away in fervent heat. When is it going to be? How is it going to be? And after all, now it's taking some years and that Christ has not come to judge the earth. How will it be if they were humble and they said, God, we're not questioning you. We're not doubting you. We're only saying that we have these uh, sincere doubts as human beings. How will it be? The Lord will have directed them as he directed Peter to understand that one day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years just like one day. We come back to Second Peter chapter 3. We go to point number two now reasons for seeming delays by god reasons for seeming delays by god when it appears that god is delaying what are actually the reasons in second peter chapter 3 verse 9 the first part of verse 9 the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness the lord is not slack he cannot be slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. Brothers and sisters, look up for a moment. You see the children of Israel in Egypt. You see how God had promised Abraham that your people will spend some time in a foreign land. After some time, I will take them out. When those children of Israel were in the land of Egypt, it appeared God has forgotten us here. How is it going to be? How are we going to come out of this place? But at the right time, God sent Moses to Pharaoh. Let my people go. He has not forgotten. Do you remember when Jeremiah had prophesied that the children of Israel were 70 years in Babylon and now they were in Babylon and people have died and people have died and people have died and it appeared that those generations in Babylon, they thought everything is forgotten but God has not forgotten and Daniel discovered from the reading of Jeremiah, he began to pray and eventually those people were sent out of the land of Babylon. Do you remember that from Genesis chapter 3 in verse 15, the Lord had said that the seed of the 
woman will come and bruise the head of the serpent. And then years have gone and years have passed. Other prophecies also came concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time. In fact, it's revealed to us as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then it says that all our sins are laid upon him. When will it be? When will it be? But one day Jesus appeared and John said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. It appears that God had forgotten, but God had not forgotten. God was still going to fulfill his promise as it was with the people of Israel in Egypt, as it was with the people of Israel in Babylon, as it was with the people of God when they were expecting the first coming of Christ. So it is today that people are thinking that God has forgotten. No, he has not forgotten. It's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us. It's long suffering toward us. That's the reason why it appears there is delay. Actually, there's no delay. The timetable of God will still be fulfilled. Apparent or seeming delays do not imply that God has forgotten his promise or abandoned his plan. From this side of eternity, when you look at the plan of God, it seems to be a delay, to be delayed. But from the other side of eternity, every plan, every prophecy is fulfilled on time, at the appointed time. Look at Habakkuk chapter 2, Habakkuk chapter 2, reading there in verse 3. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. God has an appointed time, and at that appointed time, he will do what he has said he will do. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. It tells you here the certainty that God will do what he said he will do because the vision, the prophecy is at an appointed time. And that's the reason why you need to wait for it. And while you are waiting, you are expecting. You know that God will do what he said he will do. In Isaiah chapter 30, telling us we need to wait. And God himself is waiting before he fulfills uh, that uh, promise or that prophecy. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 18. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. That's the reason he's waiting. He's waiting that he might be gracious unto you. He's not waiting because he's slack. He's not waiting because he's weak. He's not waiting because he has forgotten, because he has abandoned his plan. He's not waiting because he is now involved in another project and the other project he spoke about before is no more important, is no more relevant to his present plan. He's waiting so that the Lord may be gracious unto you. Therefore, will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you? For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. He is waiting so you wait for him. He is patient so you be patient. He is long-suffering, so keep on following the Lord, perseveringly without ever looking back. He is patient because of his grace, not because he has abandoned, he has abandoned his project. Those who equate God with man, those who judge the actions of God, as they judge the actions of man, they accuse God of being slow to fulfill his promise. Well, and that is the way we think about man. And that is the way man operates. When men, after a considerable lapse of time, fail to fulfill their promise, we conclude that it is because, number one, they have forgotten the promise. Because we waited for them now a few months, a few years, they've not done it. Our conclusion is, those men, they have forgotten their promise. And if you equate God with man, you will think that because a few years have passed and the a promise or the prophecy had not been fulfilled, maybe he has forgotten. Number two, because man does not have ability to, pray, to produce or to perform what he has promised. Because you see, for man, he may promise something too quickly and not look about his resources, about his strength, about his power, about his ability, about what he can do and what he cannot do. And he makes the promise too quickly. And when he doesn't fulfill the promise, our conclusion is he doesn't have ability to perform what he promised. And the people that equate God with man, that's the way they think. They think God uh, promised something, now he doesn't have ability to perform or produce. 
Number three, sometimes it's because human beings, they have changed their minds. The mood in which they were. The emotional state of their mind, when they promise that thing, that emotion has changed. That mood has changed. And because the mood has changed, then they change their plans. They change their mind. They don't want to fulfill that thing anymore. But God is not like that. God is not up and down in his emotion, in his thinking. He's not happy today and sad tomorrow. He's not so excited today and then he promises something in excitement and then when he's low, uh, psychologically and, and emotionally and spiritually, he changes what he said he will do in the moment of excitement. God is not like that. He's ever constant and ever steadfast and ever the same. And so then, we do not equate God with man and think that maybe he has changed his mind. There is no such thing with God. Whatever apparent delay may be observed by man should be regarded as an evidence of God's desire to bring men to repentance. It is to give men opportunity to be saved. In fact, that's what Second Peter says. He is long-suffering towards what? Long-suffering towards what? Which means then the Lord is simply giving ample opportunity for every sinner to be saved, every unbeliever to repent, every scoffer to turn to the Lord for forgiveness, to believe in Christ and to obtain salvation and to escape eternal judgment. Uh, that's the reason it appears that there is, uh, there is delay. Uh, do you remember the time of the flood? Actually, it took a number of years. Why? Look at it. In First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verse 20. First Peter chapter 3, verse 20, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited. At the time was built, Noah was building the ark. When once the long suffering of God waited, when Noah announced to them, there's going to be a flood, and all the people of the earth, they're going to be wiped away. Therefore, escape, to repent, all these evil things you are doing. You are, you are going to perish in the flood. A year passed, a year passed, 20, 30, 40 years passed, and the flood did not come. Because the long suffering of God was waiting. That's the reason it appears there is delay. Not because God had abandoned the prophecy or the project or the things they wanted to do, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing. All those many years, all those many years, all those many years, when the ark was being prepared, and the people were saying that after all, you said this thing. In fact, before this uh, young man who got married last month, uh, was born, you are giving us this prophecy that God was going to destroy the earth with water. Uh, in fact, I remember, but before I built, uh, I even started uh, having money to build house, you said that this place was going to be destroyed. Now I finished the house and a big man in society, uh, and the thing is not done yet. What are you talking about? It will never be done. No! It's because the long suffering of God was waiting for them so that they will repent, but eventually were in few that Jesus' souls were saved by water. In Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah chapter 48. Apparent delay. Seeming delay uh, was the reason why. In Isaiah chapter 48 verse 9. For my name's sake will I defer my anger. For my name's sake will I defer, will I delay my anger. Will I delay the judgment and my fury upon the people? For my, for my praise, will I refrain for thee that I cut thee not off? That's the reason why God is delaying. Because he wants the people to be saved. He wants them to come to terms with him, to repent. And then to come into fellowship with the Lord. It's for my name's sake. That's why I'm deferring my anger. And it's for my praise. That's why I refrain so that I don't cut you off suddenly. And then in Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 9, you wonder all that time when Pharaoh was resisting the plan of God, why God didn't cut him off immediately. Because of the love of God is long suffering once again. Romans chapter 9, verse 22. What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering 
the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. That is, at the time when the children of Israel were in Egypt, and Pharaoh was saying, who is that God? I don't know that God. I will not let them go. And with miracle after miracle, warning after warning, pleading after pleading, his chill was adamant. Then it says, God endured with much long suffering that Pharaoh and the others, the vessels of wrath, fitted unto destruction. In Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, verses 7 and 8. Luke 18. Verses 7 and 8. And shall not God avenge his son elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Yes, he is bearing long with them. Because he doesn't want those enemies of righteousness or enemies of the gospel or the scoffers or neo-believers or the backsliders to perish. Then he says, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Here is a question for you. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Or will the believers themselves even get discouraged and feel that since Christ has not come, and since all these things have been laid for this for so long, well, let me just enjoy myself. Let go. Just give myself to the flesh and to the world. When Christ comes, will he find faith on the earth? Matthew chapter 25. The parable that Jesus gave so as to instill wisdom into us, make us prepared, make us to get ready. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. Five were wise. They knew uh, the time had not been calculated the way we calculate time. He might not come the, way, the time we think he will come. Therefore, let's make adequate preparation. They that were foolish took their lives and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lives. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Actually, Jesus Christ had already given us all these parables telling us that it might appear to be delayed on the human side. He might not come at the time you were far bent and sanctified and going and really on fire for the Lord. It might take some time. And therefore you should make sure that you have extra preparation, extra oil, extra zeal, extra love, extra commitment and consecration to the Lord. Make sure you are so fully prepared so that should he delay on the human side, the way we calculate time, should it delay a little bit, then you'll be ready when he comes. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lambs. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lambs are gone out. But the wise answered and said, Saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. As you come to the Bible study Monday after Monday, week after week, are you getting prepared for the coming of the Lord? Are you getting the extra oil, the extra love, the extra commitment, the extra zeal, so that you are fully prepared for the coming of the Lord? Because we don't know when he will come. Or as the time is passing by. And Christ has not come. Have you become like a foolish virgin? And your oil of patience, of love, of zeal, of consecration, of holiness, of readiness, of preparedness is running out. And there's no more expectation for the coming of the Lord. And should the Lord come when you are not prepared and you are like a foolish virgin? What will be the outcome of all your worship, of all your, of all your enthusiasm and everything of the past? The wise told the foolish not so. Lest there be not enough for us and you. But go, go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in. The Lord is not going to wait for the people that are not ready. He'll come at the time he wants to come eventually. 
And then it says, they that were already went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut afterward, came also. The other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. And then the conclusion of the, of the parable, Watch therefore, for ye know not, neither the day nor the hour, wherein the Son of Man cometh. And the Lord is telling us that although he's patient, well, uh, that his patient does not mean that he's not going to come. One day he's going to come, you better get ready and make sure that you are prepared and ready every time so that whenever he comes, you'll be there, you'll be able to go with the bridegroom. In James chapter 5, James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the horseman man waited for the precious fruit of the earth. He is waiting, he's waiting, he's patient. And he's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. And he has long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth near. Therefore, keep your confidence to the very end. Because even though something appears delayed, one day, one day it will come. In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, from verse 35, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise for yet a little while, for yet a little while, for yet a little while, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We come to point number three. Repentance desired and demanded by God. Repentance desired and demanded by God. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards what? Not willing that any should perish. Not willing that any should perish. I ever sinful, I ever hardened, I ever backsliding, I ever doubting. Or whatever category or degree of scorning and scoffing, not willing that any of those sinners, some believers, doubters, backsliders, or scoffers should perish, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Hey, that's the desire of God, that's the plan of God, and that, that's the wish of God that everyone will repent. Actually, God is not willing that anyone, any sinner anywhere, should ever perish. His nature is benevolent. And he sincerely desires the eternal happiness of everyone. His patience towards sinners proves that he is willing that they should be saved. You know, wicked men desire the suffering of other people and rejoice at the suffering of other people. And when you see somebody that is happy and joyful when others are suffering, that's a wicked man. But God is not like that. God is benevolent and loving and just and good and holy. He's merciful. He does not desire the temporary suffering of anyone or the eternal suffering of any man. Men suffer on earth as a result of neglecting and rejecting God's mercy and God's way of salvation and righteousness. Unrepentant men will also suffer eternally. Not because, not because God delights in their suffering, but because they neglect or reject God's love and his way of salvation and righteousness. The Lord has offered everyone forgiveness and salvation. That's the reason Christ has not come. Look at this. In Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, reading there in verse 4. Romans 2, verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? And you see the mind of God here that when God is good and patient and long suffering and he forbears, the reason is he wants all that quality of his and all that. Love to you, to lead you to repentance. Therefore, shouldn't despise that. He wants you to repent. He's asking that you consider his love for you. 
and his heart towards you, his love towards you, so that that will lead you to repentance. In Ezekiel chapter 18, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23, Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? I told you, it's only the wicked that will rejoice when others suffer. But Almighty God does not take pleasure in the suffering, either earthly or eternal suffering of anyone. That's why he calls upon the people to repent in verse 30. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. That's the reason he's been patient. He's waiting for the sinners to repent, for the backsliders to repent, for the scoffers to repent, for the doubters to repent. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so that iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away in verse 31 from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why were ye thou house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that died, says the Lord God, wherefore turn yourselves and leave ye. In chapter 33 of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Say unto them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn that the wicked turn from his way and leave. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? And you'll see that God repeatedly, he demands repentance. He deserves repentance. Although he's a God of love, he cannot just forgive the people without repentance. Oh yes, he's a God that is merciful. But his mercy will not just overlook sin. He wanted the people to repent. That's why he called them over and over and over again. He said, turn you, turn you from your wicked way. Why will you die? He wanted repentance from them. And then he had told them in the Old Testament, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways and pray unto me. Then he says, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land and I will forgive their sins. He said that we should cease to do evil and seek the way of justice and then we cleanse ourselves from all the evil. Then come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Do your sins be as scarlet? He says he'll wash them whiter than snow so they'll they be like crimson. He'll make them as wool. That's why he said, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord for he will abundantly pardon. He wants to pardon, he wants to save, he wants to forgive, he wants us to have eternal life, but he requires, he demands that there must be repentance. In Jonah chapter 3, he could have, he could have destroyed the people of Nineveh, but because of his mercy once again, because his long suffering once again, he will want them first. And then if they repented, he was going to forgive them. In Jonah chapter 3 from verse 1, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Why forty days? Why not immediately? Why didn't God, because uh, their the, the sin was exceedingly great in the sight of God, why didn't he judge them immediately? Once again, his long-suffering, his mercy, his love, his unwillingness for them to perish. He wanted to call them to repentance. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose 
rose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes and he caused it to be proclaimed and now some published throughout the navy by the decree of the king and his nobles saying let neither man nor beast herd nor flock taste anything let them not feed nor drink water but let man and beasts be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Ye, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? Well, the reason they had the doubt is because Jonah never gave them any word of mercy, any word of salvation any opportunity that they will repent that's why they said let's do our part let's talk from our wicked ways we know we're wicked we know it's because of our sin we know it's because of our iniquity let everyone every man turn from his wicked way and let's see if god will change his mind and turn away from his fierce anger that will perish not and god saw their words that they turned from their evil from their evil way and god repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not you'll see then what god is waiting for is that there should be repentance and it requires that repentance from everyone in acts of the apostles chapter 17 acts of the apostles chapter 17 verses 30 and 31 acts 17 was touching. And the times of this ignorance got wind out, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. He wants to save, and he wants to save you, but you have to repent. He's long suffering and he's loving and merciful, and he doesn't want you to perish, but you must repent. He loves sinners, he doesn't love what they do. And he wants them to get out of danger and get out of the broad way of perdition and destruction and get to the narrow way that leads to life eternal. But you must repent. He has delayed so much on, a, on the human side, in human terms, and Christ has not come. And the believers have been wondering how long, how long, how long. Because he's waiting for you and because of his mercy for you. But you must repent. Because he has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day in the which, in verse 31, he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, in that he has raised him from the dead. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts, chapter 3, verse 19. Acts 3. 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. You see that the command is that you must turn away from your sin, you must repent. It's not enough to just come to church. It's not enough to just read the Bible. It's not enough to just raise up your hand at the crusade. It's not enough to just say, I receive the Lord as my personal Savior. You must quit sin. All the evil in your hand, all the wickedness in your hand, you must think about it and say, yes, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that I've done evil before you. Before you, before you only, have I done all these evil things? I know I'm guilty. I want you to forgive me. I turn away from all my sins according to a demand. It says, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. It's only then the times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. In verse 26, it says unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's what he wants to do. He wants to turn you away from all your iniquity. And this uh, repentance is not only, was not only preached in the early church, but to keep on preaching this repentance until, until the very end of the age, until Christ will come. In Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, verse 45, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it befitted Christ, behoved Christ to suffer, 
and to rise from the dead the third day. And that's repentance. That's it. Repentance. Turning away from sin. Confessing your sins and forsaking them. And that repentance and removal, remission, cleansing of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. He wants that repentance to be preached everywhere. And it is when we preach that repentance, people will know the way of salvation, the way of the Lord, and they will be saved. It tells us the reason why he's done that is because the sacrifice of Jesus was for everyone. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. On the side of God, he wants all men to be saved. Because of his mercy, he wants all men to be saved. Because he does not take pleasure in the suffering, in the punishment of the unbelievers, he wants all men to be saved. Because he knows the death of suffering, the agony in hell that will be forever and ever, he wants all men to be saved. We will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants all men to come to the knowledge of truth. In verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. The sacrifice is done already. The price is paid already. The blood of Jesus is shed already so that your sins can be forgiven and your sins can be washed away. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that blood is shed for you already. He gave himself a ransom for all. Then he said to be testified in due time. In John chapter 3, uh, the, th the thing is, Christ is sacrificed already and Christ is given on the cross already. And anyone that calls upon him, looks unto him, can be saved even now. In John chapter 3 verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you remember the story in the Old Testament, the people had sinned against God, but they spoke against God and they spoke against Moses. And the judgment of their sin came upon them, and serpents came into the whole camp of the children of Israel and was biting, and the serpents were biting them, and they were dying. Then they came to Moses and they said, pray for us. We have sinned against God. We have sinned against you. And then when Moses prayed for them, God said, they're going to have to do something if they want to be saved. If they want to be kept alive, if they want to pass from death unto life, from condemnation unto justification, they have to do something. You raise up a serpent and tell them, whosoever voluntarily will look upon that serpent will live. And that's what he did. And the Bible says, and everyone that beheld that serpent of brass lived. And Jesus said, in the same way, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the final sacrifice, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. In the same way, he'll be lifted up on the cross. Then it says there that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, 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 that's you. You have sinned. You feel the guilt. You feel the condemnation. Or maybe you are backsliding. And you feel the condemnation. And there's a witness of the Spirit in your heart that if you die now, you'll not spend eternity with the Almighty God because God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity because it says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And you see that that holiness that qualifies us for heaven, the righteousness of Christ in us practically lived out. You see, it is not there, and you're feeling guilty, but you are the whosoever. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You can have that everlasting life today. I said you can have that everlasting life today. The Lord has been waiting for you, but he will not wait indefinitely, because you see, while they were preparing the ark, eventually, although God waited and waited and waited, many of those people People were not saved. They didn't yield themselves to the Lord. They heard. They knew. Noah told them. Everything was plain and clear. But they neglected and neglected and neglected until the final day. And they all perished. I pray you will not perish. 
Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day of the Lord is as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness. But is long suffering towards you. Not willing that you should perish. But that you should come to repentance. Check up your life today. Should Christ come tonight? Are you ready? Rise up and let us pray. The mercy of the Lord is coming to you once again. Why wouldn't you receive that mercy? The love of God is knocking at the door of your heart again today. Why wouldn't you open the door? The Lord is saying that all those coffers are coughing, corners are cunning, unbelievers are doubting, sinners are sinning, backsliders are still far away in the, in the far country. But why wouldn't you in particular, why wouldn't you come to the Lord today? Why wouldn't you come today? Why wouldn't you come today? Do you want to be among the foolish women, among the foolish virgins, or among the wise virgins? Be wise. Be wise. Be wise for yourself. Be wise. Although it appears long that he has not come, one day he will come. And you've had enough messages, you've had enough warning, you've had enough pleading, you've had enough of the love of God. Why won't you come today? Check up your life, check up your life. Should he come tonight? Should he come tonight? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to meet the Lord? It's not willing that anybody should perish. It's in your hand. God's mercy is available for you. God's salvation is available for you. You've been long suffering, patient, merciful, loving, slow to anger. So that you will not perish. Love yourself. Think about yourself so that you say, Yes, Lord, I recognize your long suffering. I recognize your patience. I recognize your love. Then you turn away from your sin and you repent and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let His grace come into your life. Let the blood of Jesus Christ wash you whiter than snow. Is willing to forgive if you only will repent. He's willing to have mercy on you if you will only repent and call upon the Lord in all sincerity. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And him that is success, let him come and take the water of life freely. It's available for you. Call upon the Lord. Call upon the Lord. He wants to save you. If you are backsliding, he wants to restore you. If you are living a defeated life, he wants to put more grace into your life. So that the grace of God will make you to live victoriously over sin above sin. The mercy of God is knocking at the door of your heart. The love of God is knocking at the door of your heart. Don't reject, don't resist. Oh, the love of Jesus. The love of Jesus. Pure and free. Come in today. Come in to stay. Tell the Lord, I know you are merciful and loving. I don't want to perish. I hold on to your mercy today. Forgive me. Change my life. Turn me around. I repent. Save me. And it will save you.